Hi there. I'm Alone's Alter Ego. You can call me editor. And I'm just here to let you know that the video that you're about to watch was reproduced today because the original version was taken down off of YouTube for a copyright strike. So all footage and or sound clips that could have belonged to a copyright holder have been removed. And the footage that you're about to see is not from Dick Prennicky or any of the documentaries about his life, but are images that would be representative of Dick Prennicky's life. And I will be telling uh, Dick Prennicky's story, if you will, um, and how it relates to my life here in remote Alaska. I hope you enjoy this video nonetheless. So I and many others like myself were introduced to a gentleman by the name of Dick Prennicky, thanks to a couple of documentaries that had been produced regarding his life in remote Alaska. Right, Knicky? And I have spent decades reminiscing about those documentaries, though over the course of the years, I had actually forgotten some of the things that Dick Prennicky talked about. I spent more time focused on the imagery that came through those documentaries. While I'm not able to share the actual documentaries with you today, I am able to share some of his words. And I want to take a moment to compare Dick Prennicky's words to how I'm actually living here in remote Alaska. Those were the exact thoughts and sentiments that I had upon arriving in Alaska, knowing that I had a whole new lifestyle ahead of me. And once I arrived at the doorstep of this 50 year old cabin that I'd purchased that needed a lot of work, I remembered thinking, what have I gotten myself into? I was questioning whether or not I was really up to the task of what lay ahead of me. Could I handle the daily workload of hauling in wood and water? not to mention all the other things that comes with living this type of a lifestyle. I had years of overlanding experience behind me, but there's a difference between going out for a weekend or a couple of weeks into the woods by oneself compared to living by yourself for years on end. Was I going to be able to handle the winters here? And was I going to be able to handle whatever lay right outside my doorstep?
Dick Prennicky first visited the Twin Lakes area in 1962 at the invitation of Spike and Hope Carrather from Kodiak, Alaska, whom he would vacation with over the course of several years, before 1967 when pilot David Allsworth dropped him off at Twin Lakes so that he could build his own cabin on land that had been granted to him from his friend Herb Wright, also from Kodiak, Alaska, who had applied for a small track lease on the site in 1960. However, Herb had become terminally ill and before passing had encouraged Dick Prennicky to use the site instead. In the meantime, Dick would be utilizing Spike's cabin as shelter while building his own. I guess I didn't realize that he stayed in Spike's cabin when he first got to the Twin Lakes area. I knew that he had built his own cabin. It just never dawned on me where he stayed during that process. And I'm sure Spike's cabin was just good enough, meaning that it wasn't perfect. And much like my own situation, when I arrived in Alaska, I needed a place to stay. And so I bought a property with an established cabin on it. But this was far from perfect or ideal as it needed a lot of work done to it. My point being is that if we wait until things are perfect, we'll never get anywhere in life because it's never going to be exactly 100% perfect. And so for me, I'm taking it a step by step, a day by day, but much like Dick Prennicky's first year in Twin Lakes, my first year here was spent doing construction as well. serving in the U.S. Navy, Dick Prinicky landed in Kodiak, Alaska in 1950. At that time, he worked as a diesel mechanic and a heavy equipment operator until a workplace incident on a crab boat caused injury to his eye. At that point, it was 1965, and he decided to move to the Twin Lakes area, which is located 120 air miles south of Anchorage, Alaska. I really admire Dick Prennicky for being a man of action and for his ability to persevere despite the odds. He could have allowed his eye injury to keep him in town where he would have been close to medical care, but instead at the ripe old age of 51, as he said, he decided to give it a go in the Twin Lakes area and live out his dream. I know for myself personally, in the years prior to coming to Alaska, that I allowed my fears and hesitations to get the better of me. But now that I'm here, I don't remember what I was fearing. To be honest with you, I think it's only natural to be hesitant and to proceed with caution and sometimes to not proceed at all. But I am glad that I finally made the decision to put my fears to rest and make the move to Alaska. And I'm glad that Dick Prennicky made the move to the Twin Lakes area and that I'm able to share his story with you. But I'm only able to share his story with you because of Dick Prinicky being able to capture his life on film. Thank you. 
not only was Dick Prinicky a skilled craftsman, but as you can see, he was also excellent at documenting his life and the scenery and wildlife around him. And to be honest with you, he's had a huge influence on how I film my videos. If you take a look at Dick Prenicky's videos, you'll notice that before the documentary crews ever came out there, he was able to capture his life in such fluid movements and doing close-ups and wide angle shots, things that I had to learn. Dick Prenicky did it all on his own without having a television to study or the internet to research how to film. So hats off to Dick Prenicky and again, he's had a huge influence on how I film and edit my videos. But as I mentioned, if it wasn't for the documentary crews, we might not ever actually know about Dick Prenicky and his story. Well, it's easy to imagine that Dick Prenicky was alone in the Twin Lakes area for years on end. The truth of the matter is, is that he rarely went longer than six weeks without a visit from one person or another. Such visitors included Jay Hammond, who was a neighbor of his just a mere 40 air miles away from Lake Clark, who would visit him on a regular basis. Other visitors included Bob Sewer, who produced Alone in the Wilderness, Alaska Silence and Solitude, and The Frozen North, all about Dick Prenicky's life. Once the National Park Service started making their way through Alaska, Dick Prenicky was also visited by park employees and rangers on a regular and frequent basis, including members of the Allsworth family. The Allsworths were again the ones who originally piloted Dick Prenicky into the Twin Lakes area back in 1967. When Dick Prenicky was questioned about what was it that attracted him to the remote area of the Twin Lakes, he stated that you could go on and on without running into any problems. He also stated that during the winter months when the snow was deep and the temperatures were low that oftentimes he would snowshoe above the tree line and stand on a high peak looking down into the valley and that the silence was deafening other than the sound of a raven or a magpie. Despite the fact that Dick Prinicky was the only one living in the Twin Lakes area, as you can see, by all the visitors he had, he wasn't alone. And it wasn't just the documentary crews or neighbors from many, many miles away. He also had other individuals that came and visited him over the years. And while my time has just begun here in Alaska, over the past year, I've had several individuals show up on my property as well. Some expected and some unexpected, such as the original owner of the property and individuals who live many miles away from me have come to visit me on my property. I also had out-of-state guests come and stay with me for a while, which was very welcome. But regardless of who comes and goes off of this property, my goal is to be self-reliant. I would love to say that I'm going to be able to sustain myself just by what I can grow and harvest off of my own property. But as I've already shown in my previous videos, that's not really gonna be possible. And I am going to have to run into town, as I've done previously, to resupply. Now, Dick Prinicky didn't necessarily run into town to resupply, but he did get resupplied nonetheless. Throughout the year, Dick Prinicky would receive mail and or other supplies via plane. In the summertime, it was a float plane, but in the wintertime, he would have to indicate that the ice was safe to land on, which he would do by placing an empty oil drum on top of the ice. If it was still afloat, it was okay to land. Other times he would use sticks or rocks to indicate where it was safe to land. He also had indicated that he was trying to let go of modern conveniences and live a life similar to that of true Alaskans and not anything that resembled life in the lower 48, such as Seattle or Los Angeles. As I mentioned in the beginning of this video, I have a lot of respect for Dick Prinicky. And after watching the couple of documentaries about his life, I've learned a few things along the way. For one is, I learned that it's okay to doubt the path that you're on and question whether or not you're heading in the right direction. But ultimately, you shouldn't wait for things to be perfect or allow your fears to stop you from moving forward in life. And once you get there, 
it's okay to share what you see with the rest of the world, especially when the things that you're seeing are so astonishingly beautiful. And so that's why I make my YouTube videos for you. And I hope that you are enjoying these videos. And also, if you'd like to get to know somebody who had a personal connection with Dick Prinicky, I highly recommend that you check out John in Alaska. He might have an upcoming video also regarding Dick Prinicky and his connection to him. And I recommend that all of you take the time to live out your dreams and live life to its fullest. And as I always say, please stay safe and take care. And I look forward to seeing you again on the next one. Oh, and be sure to check out my live coming up on Monday at 5 p.m. Alaska Standard Time. I'll see you there.